So our next presenter is uh, from the Department of Natural Sciences. Um, so John uh, Abramian. Thank you, John. I tried to spell it out phonetically so I'd get it right. Um, John is going to talk to us about nasal plugs in chicken embryos. Who knew? Hi everyone. So, as I said, I'll talk about chicken embryos and how they develop nasal plugs during development. So, before we start, I'll talk about how the jaw develops and the nasal cavities develop in uh, reptiles and amphibians, with chickens being part of the reptile group. So, essentially, the jaw forms from three craniofacial prominences. We have the medial nasal prominence, which is, make sure, which is in the middle here. We have the lateral nasal prominence, which is on the outside. And then we have the maxillary prominence, which comes in from the bottom here and fuses with the medial nasal prominence to form an intact upper jaw. And this also helps to form the nasal cavities. And when we look at adults, we see that the lateral nasal prominence forms the alley or the nostrils here. The medial nasal prominence forms the septum of both the nose as well as the middle of the lip. And the maxillary prominence actually comes in from the sides, forms the cheekbones and the lip. And if you ever see anybody that has a cleft in the lip, it's usually on one side or the other or both. It's very rarely in the middle. And that's because in those individuals, the medial nasal and maxillary didn't quite fuse together during embryonic development. And so this occurs throughout amniotes, which are the group represented by reptiles and mammals. And we see this whether we're talking about mice, humans, crocodiles, lizards, turtles, chickens, doesn't matter if you have a beak, you have teeth, you have a long face, short face, you undergo this very same sort of basic development of structurally putting the upper jaw together before you actually form the rest of the face and develop those unique characteristics that make them look so different from each other as we can all see, okay? So nasal cavities, looking at cross sections, essentially look like this across the board. Again, depends on the shape of the face overall, but we have the nostrils on the outside where air is brought in. The air comes in through the nasal passages and then comes out the back of the throat or sometimes in actually into the mouth from openings called coani. So you have basically two openings. You have an opening in the front of the face, you have an opening in the back. Air comes in, comes into the body through the coani. Okay? And my lab uses chickens as a model for developmental biology. They're a great model. They're very easy to get, relatively inexpensive. And chicken eggs are a good tool to use because the embryo actually develops within the egg. We can actually make a window in the egg and access the embryo while it's still alive. This isn't something that you can do, obviously, with mammalian embryos because they're inside of mom and this poses some difficulty. With chickens, we can actually access living embryos. So anybody who takes my embryology class gets to see that actually happen. Right? So if we look at beak development in chickens, we see a very similar process. We have the medial nasal prominence fusing with the maxillary here in this small region. And this leaves a nostril out here. Right? You have the open nasal cavities. So while we were exploring this further, we actually started to see a phenomenon where the nasal cavity started to close. And we actually see fusion between the lateral nasal and medial nasal prominences. So it seems like the nostrils are sort of closing up during these embryonic stages, right? Which is a little bit strange. And as soon as I saw this, I remembered. I was like, you know what? I've seen this before. I'd seen this before during my postdoc years. And we published a paper on face development across reptiles and mammals. And I saw this happening in lizards. And the, in these lizards, we saw the same process where the lateral nasal and medial nasal closed up, and it was, it was a little bit strange, right? We all have sort of openings. And we were sort of limited in the lizard embryos we had, so it was, it was a phenomenon, it was curious, and we thought, okay. So we published it, we said they closed, but we couldn't really study it in depth. And I thought, okay, you know what? This is my chance. I have all these chicken embryos, they're easier to get, we can get as many as we need. Let's really study what this process is and how it relates to the development in the other animals. Now, it turns out that when you go through the literature, you actually see that the same thing happens in mammals. In fact, even in human embryos, you see these plugs that develop 
during embryonic stages early on, and then they're shed before the baby's born. So you do have this phenomenon occurring not only in chickens, but also in mammals. And this is also found both in mice and in rabbits. So it turns out that this seems to be fairly widespread, although there's very, very little information about how these actually form, what they're for, or how they actually are, leave the nasal passages, because obviously if you're born with the nasal cavities plugged, you're in a little bit of trouble, right? So they have to reopen at some point, but there's little to no information about this. And even from 1969 was this study, the earliest mention of this from, was from a study from 1910, and there's still no idea about what developmentally occurs to lose these plugs. So I thought, again, we have these chicken models, let's really take a close look at this developmental process, right? And when we go through the literature, again, chickens are part of the reptile group. I thought, okay, well, mammals have it. What about reptiles? What do we see in reptiles? And again, we see studies both in tuataras, which are a lizard-like reptile. They're not lizards, but they're within the reptile group. And then rock pythons, both of them have been documented as having these nasal plugs. So the nasal passages seem to close at some point. But again, they document it, they say, oh, it's closed, and then that's it. That's all you get and moves on. Again, obviously, it's a little bit more difficult to obtain so many embryos of these animals as we can get in chicken. So people just didn't sort of pursue that lineage. And again, I thought, okay, this is our opportunity. Let's take a look. So with a couple of students in my lab, who's, who's one of them is now in med school, the other one's applying, we actually took a look, a closer look at chicken embryos. And one of the first things we wanted to see was the fusion process of these nostrils compared to fusion of the jaw, which was well studied, and I spent quite a bit of my postdoc studying this. Now, when we look at fusion of the jaw, we see that after fusion, we have a nice intact structure. There's no separation here. There's no line you can draw. So it fuses completely and makes one structural component. Now, when we look at this fusion of the nostrils, we see that there's a blockage here. There's tissue blockage, and this never actually goes away. So these nostrils seem to close up temporarily and don't fuse in the same way. So it seems to be a different process of this nostril closure versus jaw fusion, right? <coughs> then I thought, okay, it's a little bit different. What about at later stages, right? These are CT scans of these embryos. I thought, okay, how plugged is this nose? Does it go all the way into the coana or is it just in the front? And we actually see that when we look at the level of the nostril, we see that it's blocked here, right? The nostril just sort of comes in, it's closed off. When we actually look towards the back of the nose, it's open. So it seems like this plug occurs just at the front of the nose, and this is very similar to what's being described in humans, where the front of the nose gets plugged, and then those plugs are lost. Again, they're sort of shed, although there's no literature on how they're shed or what actually happens. Um, so I thought, okay, let's take a look and see how this plug is opening up here, right? And obviously, again, you need your nose for various functions, both ourselves, whether you're a snake, you're a turtle, you're a lizard, you need your nose open for these various functions. So they have to open before the, the, the animal hatches. So let's take a look at the opening process, right? So in using just regular histology, we see that the nasal cavity, which should be opening here, is actually plugged. This is where the nostril should be. And it's this tissue layer that's very sort of homogenous with the rest of the surface area, right? So it just seems like part of the skin is just sort of filling up this nasal cavity. And when we look at a little bit later stages, we see that these cells in the middle start to open up. So now we're thinking, okay, that this is how the nasal cavity is sort of coming apart, right? It's opening up. And so we see the cells in the middle sort of expanding and getting larger. And when we look a little bit further, we see even more expansion, right? So we're, we're on the right track. The nasal cavities are opening up. And one of the first process is the expansion of these cells that are in the middle of the nostril. Again, the nostril is still closed. It's still blocked. But there seems to be the cell expansion, which is one of the phenomena that we see during this nasal cavity opening. And in fact, when we look at the very sort of area where the opening is occurring, we actually see that the cells look really stretched. So it seems like, along with these cells expanding, the embryo is obviously getting bigger with time. As it's getting bigger, these cells are physically getting stretched. And in fact, at some point, they just rip apart, right? So just the physical sort of integrity comes apart, right? So we, when we sit, sort of think of cells breaking apart, we think of them dying, undergoing these various physiological processes. 
This is just the physical sort of ripping apart that happens. And this has been documented before in tissue, so it wasn't the first time, but it was the first time with nasal cavity. So I thought, okay, this is interesting, but there's still lots of tissue on the sides here. This has to be cleaned up, right? You have to have sort of normal nasal walls. So I thought, okay, let's take another approach to this and see what happens to the cells on the sides. The cells on the side do something very strange as well. So the middle cells, they, they get wider and eventually rip. The cells on the side sort of <coughs> stack into these little columns. So they move around and they, stack, they have these sort of cell stacks. They look like little sort of hairs. And they stack into columns. So they all shift position, they stack into these columns. And then something else really cool happens. They undergo apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So, and this is this tunnel analysis, which is detecting signal of apoptosis. And we see that it's very specific to these columns. So it seems like there's multiple processes happening. There's a physical ripping apart. There are the cells in the middle that are expanding. And then the whole thing gets cleaned up by the cells on the edges dying off. And this opens up the nasal cavity. So this is the first time that we've actually seen this much detail in actually how the nasal cavities open. And the fact that they're not actually just sort of shit, like they've been described in literature, but they actually undergo these multiple different processes in order to open back up. So in fact, it looks like this is an ancestral trait across the board, although again, this is just in chickens. We, we've yet to see maybe they are shed in other animals, but it seems like across reptiles and mammals, this seems to occur, and then at some point they reopen. We still don't quite understand why. Some of the sort of hypothetical ideas put out there don't really hold water that much when you look into it. So we really don't understand why this occurs, but it also occurs in other cavities, and we're pursuing that now. And another thing we're looking at is outside of reptiles and amphibians, uh, outside of reptiles and mammals, I'm sorry, we're actually looking at amphibians now, looking at axolotl embryos to see if this occurs in them as well, and to see if this is basically an ancient trait, even more ancient trait than just having arisen in these groups here. So with that, I'd like to thank you all, and yeah.